predict the future, but you have to be able to look back on a, on a rich past. And so I want just to introduce with one anecdote um, the first speaker, because when I started my PhD in 1997, the speaker was winner of the Gordon Bell Prize, which is a prestigious award in HPC. And the application he was presenting got the prize in part for the performance, and at that time it was measured in flops per dollar. And today we measure maybe in flops per watt. The, the best machine today is 17 gigaflops per watt, and that's you know, an interesting number. At that time, the application of um, Professor Sterling ran 18 gigaflops per million dollars. And that just illustrates how far this um, field has come. In that time, these 20 years, essentially we have made a million-fold improvement in, in performance of capabilities. But we know that we are at the end of this evolution, or at least it's going slower. And that will be the topic of the talk, so stagnation at Mohs nanoscale barrier, and what we can do to do it to improve, and maybe we might have to reboot HPC to make progress. So thank you. Thank you very much for that uh, kind introduction. Um, I think we have all the electronics working here. The, the little chip is implanted in the back of my head. Uh, it, um, we have, uh, well, I, I, fortunately, uh, the chair just gave my talk. Uh, <laughs> so I, I'm going to touch on the, on the high points. Um, uh, I'm, I'm told uh, that uh, I have uh, very few minutes, so I'm going to minimize on the uh, introductory material. Nobody here needs a, uh, an introduction on high-performance computing or its important applications in uh, computational uh, physics, uh, of which materials is an important part. Uh, we are without exaggeration, at a pivotal point in the, in the domain, the interdisciplinary domain of uh, high performance computing. And I'd like to take these minutes to uh, frankly disagree with everybody in the field except those who work for me. Uh, and uh, suggest to you that there are, uh, that at a turning point, we really do have to consider the class of systems and the enabling technologies and the methodologies of going forward as being very different from those which we have benefited from successfully over the last at least two dozen years, one could argue um, uh, more than that. In fact, uh, while it may be a factor of million, I'd have to do that in my head, uh, since uh, 1997, um, and I, you were talking about my Gordon Bell Prize, right? Yeah, okay, I thought so. I, um, uh, well, you have to forgive me, I've also chaired the, the, the prize, so it all gets to be a blur. But, but the number is really much more staggering than that. In one lifetime, and I'm referring to myself, one of my favorite topics, in one lifetime, the field of high performance computing has conservatively conservatively de delivered a performance gain factor of over 10 trillion. And I say conservatively only because uh, we don't actually have benchmarks for the original machines. And frankly, in, in the original machines, the first and second generation, we tended not to measure them in flops, but in ops. Now there is a standard trend, the biology people refer to it as punctuated equilibrium. And this is an important concept, albeit metaphorical, for our own field. There are wide areas of evolution in which the changes to computing are truly incremental. The same techniques, except more of. The same technologies, but better of. Uh, and uh, the better tools as well. But we continue to do the same things. The same codes with minor modifications, perhaps, uh, uh, continue to work on the systems. And then we hit that point of singularity, that pivot point where the enabling technology changes, there are new opportunities in computer architecture, and unfortunately, that requires changes in the underlying science and applications that are performed on them. Here's my you know, one chart meets all, and these are a number of the, that I consider, at least looking back at the history, of, um, uh, of the points where the technology shifted. Now there are long tails and they overlap each other uh, in many cases. Uh, when I was uh, uh, at MIT, uh, a starting graduate student, and that would be in 77, 
uh, Seymour Cray had just delivered the Cray 1 uh, computer, a 100 megaflops machine, approximately slightly more in peak, slightly less in, in delivery. Uh, that's in the uh, middle there. Through multiple generations, computing has changed, and the small role that I played was in, in the area of uh, commodity clusters, uh, hardly a, um, a breathtaking alternative, but, but a key one in terms of performance to cost, and that accelerated the usage of computing uh, and caused changes in the development of the uh, synthesized technologies as well. Now, where do I disagree with my community right now? Over the last two dozen years, we have had this sweet spot, this almost pox MPI, in which every system after another could be programmed with the same uh, modalities, the same idioms, uh, as the systems got incrementally larger and larger. But as I will show you, uh, it's now at a point, a, a stretch point, and while we are here to discuss, among other things, the evolution to the achievement of exascale, exascale is a lovely word, it has no meaning. Um, uh, it could be exaflops if you do nothing but run Linpack all day. Um, if you're interested in, in um, uh, da big data, and uh, machine learning and so forth, then you're really talking about uh, exabytes of information, and, and one could go on. But there has been an expectation that going on, in terms of technology, would be a repetition of the past 20 plus years. And yet, people such as myself get a little bit over enthusiastic about the possibilities and get on stage like this one and rant about how everything has to change. And, and uh, I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that uh, because it, uh, a lot of people get angry about that. Um, but if I may just quietly whisper to you, everything is about to change. Here's where we are. Uh, the Sunway Taihu Light, I'm not going to discuss the politics of high performance computing, which is world straddling. Uh, I have never seen a period in my career when a focus on a singular point of performance has been so internationally embraced by China, Japan, uh, US, uh, Europe. I know I'm missing one. Um, my apologies to there. Here, the uh, Taihu light machine, 10 million cores, uh, has uh, achieved a sustained RMAX uh, performance of 93 petaflops. Petaflops, that's a big number. 93 petaflops and a peak performance of over 125 petaflops. Um, clicking over here, if you look at the red, I hope it's red, yes. The red line uh, to your right, all of those uh, dots, uh, and I guess, I may be behind half a year, forgive me. Uh, those are the Tai Hu Light. Uh, before that was another Chinese machine, and, and I'm going to get it wrong, so I won't even try. But it is dramatic that uh, the, the quest for exaflops is truly international. Now, I'm showing you this picture not so much to look at a single dot, but rather to look at the trends. You see these dashed lines. Historically, the increase, at least as measured by this, going as far back as 1993, so that's about 25 years, has been exponential. And in, not, not in a, uh, uh, a term of hyperbole, but rather literally exponential. Somewhere about 1.7x per year, again measured by the uh, HPLR <coughs> parallel impact uh, benchmark. But in the last few years, the slope of that line has, uh, has shrunk, has narrowed, and these dotted lines that you see for the lowest line, which is the 500th machine, and the highest line, which is the sum of all 500 machines, <clears throat> are clearly showing a roll-off. And this roll-off, if I had time, exists in technologies, in clock rates, in power consumptions, uh, in the performance per individual core, and I could go on. And... Here you see 
the, the extrapolation of the, um, uh, of the fastest machine moving away from the original, uh, the original um, uh, slope. It had been assumed that we knew when we would have exaflops. It was going to be in uh, 2019, I think it was October 4th, about 2.30 in the afternoon, uh, that's um, uh, Eastern time. Eastern time. Uh, that's no longer the case. You know, uh, and I've worked uh, with many teams associated with the uh, uh, U.S. Uh, national agencies, including the Department of Energy, uh, the Defense Department, uh, the National Science Foundation, and so on. And um, we all anticipated that, but it became clear that the problem was harder than we thought. And so some brave man who got fired for this uh, uh, projected that the government would hit 2024. That's when we would do exaflops and we would do it right. And we would have done that, but our colleagues in China mentioned, oh, by the way, they would have it in 2020. Well, these days there's not much I can say that's positive about uh, my government. Okay, there's nothing I can say positive about my government. And one of them is that, that, that nothing motivates them in, in science and technology uh, than a threat from another government. And so, instead of doing it right in 2023 or 2024, we find ourselves moving uh, with alacrity, that's the politest way to put it, uh, to do it in 2021 or 2022, still admitting defeat as if this were a horse race or the Olympics, uh, um, uh, but uh, trying to expedite that. Now, uh, before I go on with this, I have to point out one other th uh, two other things. First, uh, the number 500 machine is just below a petaflops. Just below a petaflops. I, re I wrote a book, Enabling Technologies, for petaflops computing, and at that time we were four orders of magnitude away from petaflops. The times have changed. But the second thing I want to point out is this slide that I'm showing you with, with no discredit to Eric Strohmeyer of Lawrence Berkeley National Lab who provided it to me, uh, is a lie. At least it's implicitly a lie, and this is very important to the discussion in this conference. Because the implication is that the, the orange and the red lines are bounding a, a, a blur of 500 machines spread out across that gap. Not true. Uh, his analysis done by, by my colleague, uh, 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 Dr. Maciek Bradowitz. Uh, and this shows the actual uh, breakdown of um, uh, the, the distribution of the, the architectures. Now I call this a three world model. Uh, you can probably figure out why. If not, I'll talk to you later. And if you see, it breaks down to a rather horizontal line uh, that referred to, I think, appropriately as mainstream. On the other side, a almost pure vertical line, which we call the flagship computing, and then we don't have a name for the middle thing. But it provides for greater accuracy. Almost all the machines are on that horizontal line in the mainstream. And the fastest of those machines is around one petaflops. So what is it we think we're doing when we're talking about exascale? Do we only care about that less than 10 machines on the leadership panel? And by the way, this is uh, slightly out of date. It goes up, it goes up somewhat uh, uh, further than this. Um, the uh, uh, fact is that the peak of high-performance computing is essentially non-existent. Except, I, I, I have to say this, for the purposes of credit and stature, spending money, and, um, and a few important scientific problems. So, in the era of achieving exascale, we are barely as a community of users of high-performance computing, we are barely approaching petascale. And yet, we're not only thinking about how to drag our technologies to exascale, but we recognize that 
hitting a point, and that being the last point, is futile. And so already we're thinking about how do we take that design point or a future design point and extend it further, much further. And that's what the last few minutes of my presentation are. I oversimplify when I say that as people look beyond exascale, beyond Moore's Law, uh, Moore's Law is uh, an extraordinary experience. Uh, we use it as a metaphor for anything that's exponential or anything we wish were exponential. And uh, the technology feature size has now a pre, uh, uh, approached nanoscale technology. Uh, five nanometers, seven nanometers, 10 nanometers in industrial laboratories and somewhere between 12, 14, and 16 in commercial products. So assuming, and I know people will disagree in the materials community, we can't get smaller than atomic granularity and not that. Um, now you're all going to tell me why we can, we can store a bit on a, on a hydrogen atom, I'm sure. Uh, but we are looking at possibilities, and there really are some. Um, the, uh, uh, probably the most exciting is a true paradigm shift in any, any nature of the, the, the term, and this is quantum computing. I'm not going to talk about quantum computing today. You could spend two lectures on that easily. I think that there are several very interesting talks about quantum computing. Um, but I will leave you with this. I believe it. I don't believe it now. Yes, if you're Amazon or Facebook or, or Microsoft or Google, you can afford to build a machine that's not a quantum computer, but call it that, really a quantum annealer. Um, and when you put in all the overheads connecting it up and making it work, it still doesn't go actually deliver faster in the sense of uh, time to solution than a conventional machine. But it will. This is good research and sometime I would guess in a dozen years, but I have no reason to uh, uh, believe my own prediction. We will have quantum computers and for some applications it will provide polynomial scaling and for some applications it will provide exponential, uh, exponential scaling and in fact there will be those uh, true um, uh, high stature uh, problems in which you will be able to execute in a, in a, in a year uh, an application that with a conventional computer could not be performed in the lifetime of the universe even if you started 13.82 billion years ago. There is a Fascinating, uh, I have no idea what that was. Uh, there is a fascinating, uh, almost obsession with the metaphor of the brain. That the brain, which uh, in case you haven't measured recently, you all have one, uh, it, your, your cr cranial cavity is about uh, uh, 1,450 cubic centimeters. You have about 89 billion, that's with a B, neurons, uh, and, um, uh, and you, you run it at about 20 watts. That excites people. Your whole body is like a, uh, what we used to call a 100 watt light bulb. Now with LEDs, of course, we're told that a 100 watt light bulb burns six watts, so the, um, the an analogy doesn't work very well, but, but um, uh, that, that capability uh, and doing things we don't know how to do today at the same time. It's very exciting. It's very exciting. It's probably wrong. The idea of building something that is reminiscent of a neuron and managing to have a, a degree, that is to say an output uh, of uh, something like 10,000 different connections all up and, and burning it, in, you know, not at saturation, but somewhere in the analog domain we will probably be able to do that. For certain interesting associative problems, we'll probably be able to use it. But it's unlikely that something like that is going to get up early this morning and quickly put together some slides so that it can then get in front of an audience of 100 people and, and describe what it's thinking about. That is not likely to happen. I myself have worked with superconducting supercomputing. Um, uh, I can take, you know, you, you really hunger. You spend 30 years in a career and you say, did you do anything? 
Okay, so in San Jose, I don't remember the year, I think it was also 97, um, uh, a small research booth uh, for California Institute of Technology, Caltech, uh, had a number of displays, and one of them was a, a, um, a large cold tube of liquid helium and some logic gates. And that one display ran the fastest clock rate that ever until that time had been run at a supercomputing conference, and that's over 10 years, and has ever since been run at the supercomputing conference, and I won't count the, the, uh, the, the time for that. 247 gigahertz. Now, unfortunately, I had trouble with the fire marshal. Uh, in, um, in San Jose, California. Uh, uh, one of his people saw what he thought was smoke coming out of this. A fire marshal, all dressed up in uniform, came to me and said, you, you cannot have this. Uh, in, in California, he referred to me as dude. He said, you cannot have this uh, because it's a fire hazard. I said, how is it a fire hazard? He said, well, there's smoke coming out of that. And the first law of being a fire marshal is where there is smoke, there is fire. I said, well, there are two problems here. First, this is four Kelvins, and nothing is going to ignite at four Kelvins. And second, second this is liquid helium, a noble gas, and it's not going to ignite with anything. They told me to turn it off. Processor and memory. We have, been, we have been following the same adages of computer structures since, uh, since von Neumann uh, first wrote the paper and forgot to put Eckert and Mockley's name on it. We refer to this as the von Neumann architecture without Eckert and Mockley architecture, right? Um, and uh, we've been following that among its many implications is the separation of memory, which in those days, or at least in the 1950s, was made out of magnetic cores and the logic that was made out of uh, vacuum tubes. <clears throat> now, in fact, the brain-inspired computing as, as many aspects of it which are very interesting. And I, I make light of it uh, only because uh, in, in, the, in the limit, I don't think that is the way we're going to build intelligent computers. But being sim uh, both brain simulation, which is critical both to the medical aspects and the understanding of it, uh, is, um, uh, is, is important. And there may be some algorithmic issues that we derive from this technology. So, so uh, uh, we work with uh, colleagues in Geneva at uh, EPFL on the simulation of uh, 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 neuronal structures. And um, uh, my chair has just told me I have four minutes left. This is a, a, a direct empirical example of wishful thinking. Um, now, you know, what is the general law of computing or of high performance computing. I, I am now presenting it to you. Uh, it consists in the challenges of starvation, of latency, of overhead, and contention. And any system that you tend to look at or care to look at over the last 60 plus years of computing will be ultimately uh, uh, sensitive to. The performance will be a product of, and the problems will be an imposition of these four uh, activities. There is, however, now in exascale computing, a fifth problem, which is asynchrony, and that is the uncertainty of the amount of time it takes to achieve uh, an action, in particular an action at a distance within, within such a machine. This brings us to the fact that we are at a point in time where we can no longer stretch the von Neumann architecture model in order to achieve the next one to four orders of magnitude in performance gain, if in fact we can achieve it at all. We should not be optimizing for the utilization of floating point units. That was once a very important, perhaps the important metric of success. FPUs are very small. The rest of the architecture is very large. That is really a stupid thing to be doing. Right. Stupid, I mean dumb. You, you get me, right? That's the wrong thing. Okay. Now, the second, of course, is the separation of logic and memory. We even call it the von Neumann bottleneck. 
That was important when the technologies for the two were very different. Now they are the same. Modulo, some differences in process, manufacturing processes. We want parallel execution, so we issue sequential instructions. And we have to pretend that our access to our memory is sequential consistent. How does this make sense? Oh, and by the way, you don't even notice it, but you've got registers in there. Those registers are completely different from the main system, have a completely different namespace, cause their own critical problems in doing that. You don't need that. So, what should you do? Well, I don't know how to draw it, but if I did, this would be a fun time. I, I named it. And so, don't pay attention, but it is the merger of the three important primitive Microfunctions, and those are, of course, information storage, information uh, transformation, and information transfer or communication. And if we can build a single piece of logic, we can. That does all of these at the same time, we can. And put them in a tiny, tiny little space, much smaller than an ARM processor, of which we're going to hear some interesting things later. Then we can build something like this. Oh, how excited you are. It's a, it's a triangle. Yes, but this triangle has lots of triangles in it. Each triangle has more triangles in it. As they say, it's turtles all the way down. Uh, these uh, triangles, these funtons, are not, are not even logically as sophisticated individually as a core. But they are, in fact, in the aggregate much more efficient in the use of the die area, of the energy area, and in the issues of starvation, latency, overhead, and yes, contention. We choose this particular form of tessellation, not because there aren't others, but because the ratio of the communication uh, to the other functions is smallest possible, and this proves to be an important uh, engineering optimization. If you take these chips and you put them together on a, on a, um, a die and, you, um, and then put it on an MCM and then you stack the dies even within the MCM and then you put those on boards and those boards on cases and where you get the picture and you build a large structure, well, you can get exascale. Now, if I did it the way we all do it, using racks, we've done the numbers, uh, it would take about 900 square feet, about uh, around 90 square meters. And that is if you organize it in a cylinder, which turns out to be the wrong way to do it, but it looks nice. Um, if you do a different form of packaging, a dense form of packaging, uh, then uh, you in fact can have an exascale within four square meters of footprint. That's four square meters. I know I'm drifting back and forth between meters and, and, uh, and feet here. Uh, I, I spent 14 years at NASA, the space organization in the US, and there was a bad moment in their history when they got feet and meters mixed up too, and a spacecraft blew up over Mars. That wasn't the success criterion. Here are the computer I first mentioned, which was the Taihu Light, and uh, the total architecture that we talk about, the different uh, pair of design points, uh, the, the simultac is the entire aggregate. Now, I just want to point at uh, two uh, lines here, which I have to find. Uh, there it is. Peak performance, almost 10 exaflops versus uh, about 100 petaflops in, in uh, the Taihu light. And I mean no disrespect for the Chinese machine. If you go to the bottom line, that uh, uh, times 100 improvement is in 25 square meters versus uh, uh, 605, and you get a factor of 100 benefit. I'd love to talk more about it, but um, my chair is getting antsy, and so I come to my last slide. And I point out that, yes, I'm modest enough to admit there are several potential challenges uh, to this. One is the notion of memory density. It is not DRAM dense, although we have an aggregate or an, an external uh, DRAM put on top of our stacks. 
Um, the uh, clock rates, uh, we still don't know. We're operating in our analyses uh, around 120 megahertz. We go up to less than 500 uh, megahertz. Hold that number in your head. Feasibility, it's good. It's, it's, it ordinarily is absurd for someone in academia to tell you how they're going to beat the, build the fastest computer in the world. But we're not. We're going to build the tiniest computer in the world. And we're just going to build millions of them. Maybe a billion of them. And package it. Um, and so, that looks like the last. But I have to, I, I, I wasn't permitted to put up a slide in my last comment. Exaflops is not the goal. Exaflops is mi merely the continuation point to scientific computing way, way further than that. So we've done the numbers. We have the spreadsheets. We've computed the energies. I know this meeting's about exaflops. I'd like to cl close my talk by talking about zetaflops. Zetaflops, using this architecture model, is entirely doable. By 2027, because we want to take a little bit longer than we need, 2027 will produce exaflops with the technologies that we anticipate within the next three to five years. With the same architecture, therefore using the same software for this architecture. And at a much lower cost, on the order of an order of magnitude lower, than if we could stretch conventional technologies today. And in a tiny, tiny footprint compared to conventions. So, yep, I'm done. That's it. If I had more time, which clearly I don't, I would go on and talk to you about the feasibility of yata flops. But I don't. Thank you all very much. <laughs>